God bless you. Have your seats in the presence of the Lord. We are, amen, so excited to share the word with you all this morning. John chapter number four is where we'll spend our time uh, preaching from. It's a very powerful text uh, that comes up in our lectionary this this uh, Sunday, and uh, it deals with uh, a very a significant woman um, who has a powerful encounter with Jesus at the well. And uh, in honor of uh, our women's uh, Women's Month, Women's International Day that uh, passed this week. I found this passage to be a very apropos passage, a powerful passage that uh, gives us um, who are looking for the ways in which Christ affirms women, the ways in which Christ uh, literally in a, a society and a culture that deemed women as second class citizens. Christ literally breaks taboo and, 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 and pushes back up against uh, some of the sensibilities of his day. Uh, it is worth noting in this text that uh, Jesus does a, a, a very countercultural thing uh, when he interacts and dare I say, commissions this woman. Uh, some uh, theologians, some uh, uh, commentators say that this was one of the first apostles that Jesus uh, sent out. An apostle is someone who literally goes and proclaims the word of God and prepares people to hear and have an experience and an encounter with God. And unfortunately, throughout history, uh, there have been those who have tried to limit that function or that that office uh, to men only, but you know, if you're looking, praise God, for uh, the ways in which uh, God seems to 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 upset and disrupt some of these uh, biases and prejudices, you have a great text right here, Amen. Where uh, Jesus is literally turning upside down some of the social norms that seek to. Uh, reinforce inequality. It's a wonderful thing to know that even within the culture of his day, Jesus was not playing along to get along or going along to get along. Jesus would disrupt things. And that's partly why Jesus ended up on a cross. Uh, I mean, there is this, this, this truth that Jesus came to save the world from the world's sins. There is this, this, this theological claim that we make as, as Christians that Jesus was sent to literally redeem humanity from their sin. Uh, but I want you to know that there's always some kind of social causation that leads to the persecution of God's people. Uh, none of us exist in our divine purpose in a vacuum. Uh, it is the way we live in the world that often uh, opens up space for God's work to be done through us, even in sometimes our trial. And so this is a powerful, powerful, I think, uh, example and expression of some of the reason why Jesus was so upsetting to some people. Because there are people in your life who are happy to maintain the status quo. The status quo in our society, the status quo in your relationship with them, the status quo in their life. But how many of you know that when Jesus enters, a lot of things that are status quo get turned upside down? Amen. Y'all quiet in here this morning. Anybody had their life turned upside down by the Lord? Amen. Amen. You, 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 thought, you thought when I came to Jesus, it was going to just be now a, a nice coast to glory. Amen. It's more like a roller coaster. Praise God. I don't know if many of you all ever see those, those uh, YouTube videos where they folk get on this slingshot and they, they excited to get on it until they get on it. And then they trying to figure out who tricked me and and take me off, let me out, and they passing out, and speaking in tongues, and crying, and how many know that's your journey with Jesus sometimes, right? It's like, I, I wish I'd have stayed off this ride. <laughs> wish I could talk to somebody. Amen. But it's too late. Tell your neighbor, it's too late. You in it now. Amen. So 
Let's just buckle on up for the journey. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him buckle on up for this journey. Give me some more to send the monitors, please. John chapter number four. So this is a, a, a long story. I'm going to read all of these verses. I'm invite you to read along with us uh, on, 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 the, on the screen or uh, in, your, in your Bibles, your phones, however you follow along, because I don't want to take for granted that many of us have read this story before. Amen. And so let's just follow along and you can kind of, uh, I'll stop and make a little commentary along the way and uh, we'll get through this sermon together. John chapter number four, verse number five, and the scripture says, so Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Many of you who are Bible students will remember that Jacob was the father of many sons, and one of them, his name was Joseph. Jacob had an encounter with God at a well, and the scripture says that Jacob wrestled all night long with an angel, and he was trying to get a blessing from God, and the scripture says that Jacob said he would not let go until the Lord blessed him, and, 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 and he literally wrestled all night long with an angel, and the angel literally, the scripture says, touched uh, Jacob's uh, hip, and Jacob's hip came out of socket, and he had a permanent limp as a sign, as an example, as a, a, a wound, if you will, to signify that he wrestled with this angel all night long. Well, this well uh, became a sacred place in the uh, the, the, the story of the Israelites, the story of the Hebrew people. And so here you find Jesus coming to this well, this place where Jacob literally wrestled with an angel all night. Jacob's well was there and Jesus, who was tired out by his journey, was sitting by this well. And it was about noon. And a Samaritan woman, somebody say Samaritan woman, came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And his disciples had gone to the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to Jesus, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And Jesus answered her, said, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Jesus is like, if you knew who you was talking to, you would be asking me for some water and not the other way around. Yeah. Amen. Just kind of goes to show you there's a theologian, I think his name is Carl Rahner, talks about uh, people having encounters with God and don't even know it's God. He calls them anonymous Christians. Amen. But we just another conversation for another day. And the woman said to Jesus, sir, you have no bucket. And the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? I don't know if they, she thought he was talking about the, the, the water that Pastor Tanisha drinks. where you just don't age, praise God. I don't know. He's trying to figure it out. Verse number 12 said, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? And Jesus said to her, everyone, everybody say everyone, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Jesus saying, yeah, this, this is a sacred spot we had, Jacob's well, but listen, even if you drink out of this sacred well, you still going to be thirsty again. Verse 14, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. By this time, this woman is like, all right, sign me up. <laughs> I'm looking for that kind of water, right? Verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said, you're right in saying I have no husband for you have had five husbands. 
And the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. Man, Jesus, you putting her on blast a little bit. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> Jesus is like, all right, I'm about to, I'm about to go, go into your situation. Ain't that rude to Jesus, amen. How many of you felt like Jesus was rude to you? Praise God. It's like, Jesus, I just came here to give you my heart. You all in my business. I, I asked for some water. You telling me about all the stuff I already know about. Just give me what I asked for. You ever had to talk to Jesus like that? I know you haven't probably out loud. But in your mind, you'd be like, I just came here to get a little something. Jesus out here embarrassing me. I felt like that many times. I want you to understand. And the woman said to him, sir, I see you are a prophet. Now she's starting to understand there's something else going on right now. I'm asking for water. He asked me for water. He tell me he got water. I asked him for water. He in my business. He knows stuff he should not know. If this was just about some water, <laughs> man, we'd be sip, sip, passing, praise God. But there's something else going on right now. She goes on. Now, this woman, it's a fascinating pivot that she makes, right? Because in this text, what we see is a woman who obviously is clear about the social distinctions she is bound up in. Jesus encounters her on a human-to-human -human level. Jesus does not start by describing her social conditions. This woman injects first, why are you talking to me? I'm a Samaritan and you a Jew. I, you know, I don't know necessarily what made her be, make, what made her able to make that distinction, but it's worth noting that Samaritans and Jews had a very tenuous history because during the Exile in the 5th century BCE, if you will. Many of the Jews, the Hebrews who were taken into Babylonian captivity, not all of the Jews were taken there. Many of them that were taken there were considered the best of the best. They were considered the most educated, the most skilled. They were considered those individuals who would contribute best to the Babylonian or Assyrian Empire. Many of those left behind in the lands of the Hebrews, of the Israel, their indigenous land, were probably working class or very poor, low status individuals. These folks left there obviously continued to practice what they understood was their religious, Judaistic practices, but they also kind of married into other kind of cultural groups. And so over time, what you had is two parallel groups of people who came from the lineage of Jacob, both describing themselves as Israelites are Hebrews, but they had an offshoot. Samaritans were considered a mixed breed of Israelites. And the Jews who went into the exile had a pride about them being able to maintain their purity. I don't know why this woman was able to look at Jesus and tell that he was a Hebrew and she was a Samaritan. But she had a way to figure it out just by their initial encounter. Isn't it interesting that she introduced what Jesus did not emphasize? And then she, you know, starts to figure out in this text that, man, there's, there's something different about this person in our interaction. First of all, not only was she a Samaritan, but she was a woman. Now, you know, the social conditions of that day, you know, random men ain't supposed to be talking to women unless you're trying to get down, you know, have a little creeping episode. But that in and of itself would have been a problem because, you know, she's supposed to be accounted for because the social status of that day would not have a woman out just 
moving through the society without her being accounted for. Then in this verse, number 19, she says, I see you are a prophet. She starts to go into her own religious understandings of what Samaritans and Jews believed about the place where you could worship God. Why am I saying all this? I'm saying this because this woman was not an ordinary woman. She was an extraordinary woman that had a deep sense of her own journey, her own cultural and social standing. And Jesus, I want to believe, when he ran into her, saw something in her that she could not see in herself. And ain't that just like God? God will meet you in ordinary places. You think I'm just here to get some water. <laughs> She's like, well, you know, true, you're here to get some water. But there's always something deeper that I'm willing to do in your life because I see something in you that you can't see in yourself. You ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, there's something in me that you can't see. Amen. Something in me. Uh, keep on reading verse number 20. Our ancestors, this is the woman now giving Jesus a theological lesson. Now, listen, she just said, you must be a prophet. So let me give you a theological lesson, prophet. I want you to, y'all may not appreciate how audacious this woman is. She just said, you must be a prophet. A woman is telling this man she don't know you a prophet. Then she's going to start to give him a theological lesson. It's a bad sister, man. It's a married woman. She ain't playing no games. She willing to give strange men water. She willing to, you know, talk to them like, why are you talking to me? You don't know me like that. We, don't get, we ain't supposed to be getting down. Now she's telling this man, our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. This was one of the differences between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Samaritans believed that you could worship God wherever you were because they did not have access to Jerusalem. But the Jews said you can only worship God in Jerusalem. She is now giving Jesus a theological lesson about worship. Again, she was going to get some water. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming where you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Listen to Jesus now. Building on her knowledge, what she knows, Jesus didn't take her from what he knew, Jesus met her where he was at, where she was at, and he says, you worship what you do not know. We worship, talking about the Jews, what we do know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. Verse 24, God is a spirit. And those who worship God must worship God in spirit and truth. The woman said to Jesus, oh, my goodness, I know the Messiah is coming. When he comes, the Messiah will proclaim all things to us. Woman, she, she going down. She's she like, okay, you say that, but I, I know about the Messiah. Because, you know, I'm, I'm, a good, I'm, a good, I'm, a, I'm a good student of our history. Jesus says to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. And this is quite an encounter, right? I know many of us who've read this passage, we, just, we don't even go down this rabbit hole. We just like, woman at the well, and we love to worship him in spirit and in truth. And that's all we talk about. Woo! I'm going to learn to worship Jesus in spirit and in truth. But I want you to understand that this is a deeply theological encounter that Jesus is having with an ordinary woman in an extraordinary manner. And guess who walks up? His disciples. <laughs> I, want you to, <laughs> I want you to understand a few things, right? Jesus' disciples were not yet caught up to what Jesus was doing. Jesus is out here upsetting cultural norms. His disciples are out here astonished. Verse 27, that Jesus was speaking with a woman. 
But no one wanted to say anything. They didn't want to say, oh, Jesus, what do you want from her? Why are you speaking with her? You know, disciples and they walking up. They left Jesus, go get some food. They come back, Jesus is here with a, with a woman at a well. And they're like, man, what is Jesus? Jesus is Mac- What Jesus got his game? What is, what is this about? <laughs> Jesus, we can't leave you nowhere. You always got strange women. You always encountering with people. We, 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 what is, what is this about, Jesus? But they didn't have the courage to ask him that. Mm -hmm. Then the women, woman left her jar and went back to the city. And she said to the people, come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? They, talking about the people she went to tell this story to in the city, left the city and were on their way to meet Jesus. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, saying, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have, to, I have food to eat that you do not know about. Man, Jesus is talking about water that you can drink and never run out food that you can't have (laughs) you're gonna talk about a diet jesus like i'm 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 trying to i'm I'm on a different diet i got i got access to different stuff than what you guys have so the disciples said to one another surely no one has brought him something to eat disciples you know they, they, they 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 caught that jesus was worth following but they couldn't catch up to what jesus was doing Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Do you not say four months more than the harvest comes? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe for harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that city believed in Jesus because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and Jesus stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Man, I love reading that story this week. I I was thinking, man, how am I going to chop this up into 30 minutes? I said, well, I think the first 10 minutes, I'm just going to read the text. Because I think there's something all of us could gain from this text just by reading. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. For the next 15 minutes, I got left in my preaching time. I'm just going to try to talk a little bit about thirsty no more. Thirsty no more. Now, as we move through the season of Lent, Lent has in the Christian tradition always been an important six-week journey whereby many in the Christian tradition use this six weeks to uh, engage in the spiritual discipline that many of us have been learning more and more about, rooted in the disciplines, right? We started this year off with a consecration or fast, and so many people will choose during the Lent season to remove something from their life so they can experience a a little bit of tension and, 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 and sacrifice on the way to resurrection as a way of being in solidarity with the journey of Jesus's journey towards the cross and resurrection. That journey of of literally starving or strangling something within you, a vice, a a, a weakness, a proclivity, uh, causing it to lose its influence in your life, 
Over this next six weeks, it's a practice that many have engaged in. Why? Because they realize that in order for me to experience life, I must also be open to dying to some things. That resurrection must be preceded by death or else there's no need for resurrection. You don't need to ra raise something from the dead if it's still alive. I mean, this was and continues to be one of the greatest uh, theological uh, offerings and, and convincing proofs of Christian faith through the years, meaning that many people in the Christian faith early on were so compelling because they believed that following Jesus and accepting Jesus gave them victory over death. That they did not have to allow death to determine literally their life. That there was an eternal life, an existence beyond death. And so if we are going to move from death to life, the questions that I always like to invite us to think about is what are the things in our lives that we must literally Remove the catalyst that caused them to stay alive and active. And what are the things that we must feed in order to catalyze resurrection? Uh, we have said this many times before. I heard this from my pastor some years ago uh, where he said, what you feed the most will have the most power over you. That in many respects, what we give the most energy to, what we feed in our mind, in our body, in our heart, in our spirit, will literally take on a life of its own. I don't know how many of you have watched this uh, wild and crazy show on HBO called The Last of Us. Yeah, I, 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 did, I stumbled onto it because I was bored this week and I binged the first six, seven episodes. And pretty much it talks about this virus that that literally turns into a bacteria and it just it just it just literally kind of consumes the individual, takes over their mind and their body as a way to stay alive. A little bitty thing literally feeds on the internal organs and DNA of the body and it consumes the body turns it into a zombie. And I started to ask myself, God in heaven, what is in my life that starts off as a little thing and eventually is fed so persistently that it turns me into a zombie? I said, Lord, help me to die off to some things that may turn me into something utterly different than what God created me to be. God did not create us to hate one another. God did not create us to be at war with one another. God did not create us to be, uh, 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 have an appetite that is so insatiable that we would literally take from those who have little so we could have more. I'm not an uh, expert at banking, but I did call one of my, one of my banking friends, uh, Brother Danny, member of our church, just to ask him, you know, is this Silicon Valley bank thing, is this something we all need to be worried about? He said, well, it's too early to tell, um, but I wouldn't, you know, make a bank run on your bank tomorrow necessarily. Uh, but he did say, you know, uh, what's so interesting is that uh, the folks who were leading the bank were the wealthiest of the wealthy, and they still took more on their way out <laughs> the door of the crisis. And I kept asking myself, you know, if I was a billionaire, I don't know, I'm not one. But maybe when you become a billionaire, you think differently. But if I were a billionaire and I knew I was crashing somebody else's stuff, I would probably just take what I have and move on. I don't know I would take more going out the door. But it does expose this spirit of greed, if you will, that is amok in our current global society, where you have oligarchs and 
uberly wealthy folk who don't seem to ever have enough. And so I wonder for them, is the virus that's in their life causing them the virus of greed to not be able to move without being a zombie? To be so overtaken. You see, when you are too thirsty, you will do things that others who are not as thirsty as you <laughs> would do now you know i don't want to be too verbose with this thirsty metaphor but as survival instincts go it cannot be more basic than this that water is the most abundant molecule in the human body water makes up 70 percent of our body weight it performs a host of important internal functions including maintaining your body temperature it transports vitamins, minerals, hormones, and other substances to lubricate your joints and your eyes, your intestines. And you could only, we could only survive for a matter of days without water. When you get thirsty, it is your brain telling your body that you are literally running out of that which you need to live. But when you study thirst, you realize that the thing in your brain that causes you to know about the, the, the irregularities in your body relating from thirst is called the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus helps you and your body to stay on the equilibrium. Your hypothalamus tells your brain, listen, you are out of balance. And you need to get some water. Well, I wonder what is our spiritual hypothalamus these days? What is that that causes you and I to stay in balance with God and what God is seeking to do in our lives? Because if your body can only go three days without some water, I wonder how long can your spirit go without the kind of water Jesus was talking about? Because again, Jesus shows up to the woman at the well asking for water for his body, but Jesus quickly pivots to a different kind of water. It takes a minute for the woman to catch up to what Jesus is talking about. But when she does, this woman is game. She's like, okay, Jesus, obviously we're not talking about this little bucket and jar I got no more. We're talking about something altogether differently. I want to believe that this woman had something in her that was causing her to realize, God, we have moved beyond drinking from the well to another kind of conversation about thirstiness when was the last time child of God that you moved from the obsession and preoccupation with your human thirst I'm not saying that you ought not be thirsty in your human body but I'm wondering when was the last time you had an encounter with Jesus that activated the spiritual hypothalamus that caused you to ask some different questions about God. How can I be thirsty no more in my spirit? I mean, I know I got to take care of my body. I got to drink three, four gallons of water a day. Check. I know I got to maintain the 70% of water in my body so my, my, my organs can function. Check. But when was the last time you took inventory of what you must do to make sure your spirit is well cared for. I want to argue that one of the biggest spiritual problems we have in our culture today is we're too thirsty. We're, we're looking for satisfaction from sources that are akin to the jar this woman brought to the well. I want you to think about this for a second. I don't mean to get too deep in the last few minutes of my sermon, but I, I want you to think about this woman brings a jar to a well. 
which means two things. She can only get her jar filled from another jar that is literally dug into the ground. Two finite sources to go back to her village and carry on with her life, but she got to keep coming back. She meets Jesus, and Jesus says to her, listen, I can give you water, but you'll never have to come back here again. She shows up with a jar. Jesus is offering to give her a spring. She shows up with a, a jug, and Jesus is saying, there's something in you that I can activate. Whew, Lord, help me in here today. Where you, you wouldn't even be able to fit everything that I'm about to activate into that little measly jar you showed up with. I, I, I wonder, can you picture what Jesus sees in you? That you show up with a jar and Jesus sees in you a spring. Jesus says, I know that you thirsty, but guess what? There's something inside you that with one touch from me, I can turn your limited water into an eternal spring. Lord, I feel a little something in here today. You, you, you ought to pat yourself on the chest and say, I got a spring inside of me. That there's a, a, a spring of eternal life that's literally inside of you. Oh, my goodness. Uh, God, God wants you to know, child of God, that you, you may think that you're limited and you may think you got to depend on the external things, but God says there's something that I've created you with that you're not even aware of. I, I know that you may have gone through life and you may have had some social circumstances that may have disqualified you in the eyes of other people. But Jesus says, that's all right. Uh, I still see in you a spring of living water. I know you may be a woman, but that's all right. Uh, I still see something in you that uh, other folk can't necessarily see. I know you, you may have had, you know, a little challenge here and there with your relationships, but that's all right. I see something in you that other people have not seen. Jesus was telling this woman that if you can have faith in what I can do in your life, with one touch, I see a spring of living water. Lord, I can't preach this like I feel it today. Uh, I see in you a spring of living water uh, that, that if you just allow it to start bubbling up on the inside, even when you leave this place, you may not leave with your jar, uh, but you're going to leave with something that will never make you thirsty again. Uh, do I have anybody that says that's the kind of water I want where I will leave and never thirst again? This is the path from death to life. That if I could just get a touch of Jesus and a little bit of that spirit that he wants to put inside of me, that I believe that there is a well that does not come from Jacob. There is a well that does not come from the earth, but it comes from the spring of living water. And if I can get a little touch of that spring, then every circumstance that I face, I will never thirst again. I won't feel inadequate. I won't feel like I don't have enough because I know that the God in me is bubbling up some power, some life, some strength that the devil can't quench. Somebody shout hallelujah. A spring of living water. Stand with us, everybody. We're getting ready to pray. I, I, I want you to, to just ask yourself a few questions. What makes you thirsty? How do you quench your thirst? And are you conscious that the thirst that you may think is able to be filled by the water in the well can only be filled by the water that 
God can give you. It's one thing to keep drinking water, drinking water and never having your thirst quenched. There's a medical condition for that. Different forms of diabetes. There's a description for dry mouth and these kind of realities where you're constantly trying to satiate your thirst. But maybe humbly I offer you to you today that when you've done all you can to satiate the thirst in your life and it cannot be filled, maybe there is a spring of living water that Jesus is inviting you to turn to. I got all the money in the world, but I'm still thirsty. I found love in all the right and wrong places, but I'm still thirsty. I got the titles, I got the social status, I got the friends, I got the position, but I'm still thirsty. As we travel to resurrection, I want to invite you to think about perhaps there's some things that I'm feeding that must die. And there's some things that God wants to satiate in my life that cannot be satiated by Gatorade and Sprite and, and Aquafina, Crystal Geyser. <laughs> but there's something in your soul. This is what Augustine says, that your heart will not be at rest until it finds its rest in God. Come, ye who are thirsty, come to Jesus. Jesus says, I'll give you water to drink and you'll never thirst again. Grab the hand of someone next to you or near you. God, I pray for the person who I'm touching I'm praying, God, that you will cause them to be open to this truth that there is a desire and a thirst in their life that can only be filled by you. God, I pray that the life of Jesus, so paradigmatic of the ways in which we are called to push against the social stigmas that keep us divided from one another, that that can't even be a source of our thirstiness because we are meant to be in love with one another, not at odds with one another. God, may I, may I literally starve to death the racism, the misogyny, the sexism, the homophobia, the transphobia, the, 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 the hatred towards other nation groups and peoples. May I starve to death those things in me that literally cause me to hate my brother, my sister, and my loved one. Because God, you have not called me to hate. You have not called me to fall into categories that put me above my loved one, but we are to be literally in love with one another god may i strangle that god there may be some some circumstances social conditions that i am putting too much energy in god i pray that lord you will help me to put those things keep those things in their proper place but god i pray today that i will prioritize the thirstiness of my spirit god i i, I want to drink from some wells that literally cause my spirit to never thirst again. God, I can be in a hellish situation, but I know if my spirit, God, is drinking from the spring of living water. Even while I go through, God, I'm not thirsty while I go through. I'm not driven by my desires while I go through. But God, I'm going through with the power of your spirit holding me bless the person i'm touching give them lord god what they need to have a spring of living water bursting 
within them. Lift those hands where you are. God, I pray for a spring of living water to burst inside me. Tell the Lord, burst it inside of me. I need, Lord, your joy to break open in me. I need your peace to break open in me. I need your joy to break open in me. I need your love to break open in me. Lord, that I may drink from this well of living water and I know that you're able to do it God because you've done it so many times before God I pray today that you will remind me God that what is in me is greater than the world against me and I'll say and we'll say thank you Lord in Jesus name we pray come on hug two or three people and tell them I'm thirsty no more I'm thirsty no more